In this video, I'm going to be discussing the evolution of the nervous system. And to me, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of biology to ask ourselves, how can we go from something as simple as a prokaryote with no membrane bound organelles, no chromosomes, no mitochondria, and turn it into something as complex as a human brain. And this presents a problem to many of us, myself included, when we have to ask ourselves things about like chicken and the egg, which came first and how do you get to this point where we look at life and we're amazed by how complicated it is. And what we see with the brain is kind of a trifecta of things. You're gonna need neurons to transmit information between points A and B. You're going to need synapses to connect these neurons and you're going to need circuits to create these kind of patterns to get some kind of use from all of your neurons connected with synapses. And the point is there needs to be a purpose for each one of these three criteria in order for the other two to kind of sustain each other. So this is an even harder question to ask than did the chicken or the egg come first? Because in this case, it looks to us at the surface like we need all three of these things to come in order for us to get to the point we're at now. And so this notion that we're running into is called irreducible complexity. And so to break down this problem, we're going to first look at prokaryotes. And we know that all life requires an ability to maintain homeostasis. We need to keep a concentration profile inside of our cell that is regulated in order to perform metabolic pathways that allow us to live, such as glycolysis and cellular respiration. And prokaryotes, the most ancestral life on Earth, uh, next to archaea also had this problem. And so to combat it, they had ion channels and ion pumps in order to control the movement of ions and the concentration of ions within the cell. And what an ion concentration fundamentally is, from an electrical perspective, is just a, in a voltage. It's a potential difference. If you were to place an ion within an electric field, it will travel along the field lines down a concentration gradient. And by pumping ions into and out of the cell, we are establishing these ion gradients and voltage potentials. And so what happens next in life is that there's endosymbiosis and prokaryotes work intimately with each other to the point that we begin to have uh, some mitochondria actually coming into other prokaryotes and we generate eukaryotes and within eukaryotes they are initially unicellular species such as paramecium paramecium or excavata which is a member of the protist family but it is still a eukaryote we have a nucleus we have membrane bound organelles and what the eukaryotes do that's really cool what the paramecium does is it will use tactile stimuluses which is just a fancy way of saying if it hits something like a wall, the ion channels within the surface of the cell within the phospholipid bilayer are going to open or close and it's going to change the voltage, the concentration of ions within the cell. And the consequence of changing these voltages is going to be a reversal in the direction that the cilia are beating. And you ask yourself, why do why is this important for paramecium? It's because if they hit something, it means they're going the wrong way and they need to back up. And so it's a very primitive kind of response to a system, but it is alluding to more complex features down the road. And so as life continues to evolve and eukaryotes become multicellular, they need an ability to collectively respond to some kind of event. And periphera, which are sponges, are one of the most ancestral members of the animal kingdom, and they are very large organisms. They have many cells, and the way sponges work is they have the opening at the top of them, it's kind of like a chimney, and the diameter of this opening needs to be adjusted accordingly to control the amount of water that will travel through the sponge. If a sponge needs to extract more nutrients from water because they're just filter feeders, they need to dilate that opening and let more water through um, and what they need to do is have some mechanism in place for causing the entire sponge all the cells to contract collectively and so what we see are the emergence of things that 
uh, some researchers call protoneurons. And much the same way that we saw with the paramecium, we're creating these calcium ion waves. And these calcium ion waves propagate through gap junctions. And gap junctions are just these little connections between these physical openings between two adjacent cells. And that allows these calcium ion waves to propagate through and allow some kind of primitive mechanism of uh, communication between cells. And what we see with these gap junctions is an electrical stimulus, I'm sorry, an electrical synapse that allows these electrical stimuli to move between cells. And so in order to get to the point that we're at with the human brain, there needed to be a point in time in which neurons would, instead of just looking at electrical impulses, respond to chemical stimuluses. And what we find is that if we go all the way back to prokaryotes, they had integral binding proteins in order to allow glutamate into the cells when there was glutamate around. And these are called integral binding proteins because they're proteins that exist within the phospholipid bilayer of these unicellular protists and prokaryotes. And what happens in eukarya is that there are cells that begin to intentionally release packets of glutamate downstream to cause activation events in the downstream neuron. And in the case of glutamate, what happens is as we have cells specializing and communicating with each other, when glutamate binds to these ligands on the cell surface, it opens up ion channels. And when these ion channels open, it lets positive cations on the outside of the cell rush into the cell down the concentration gradient. And this is a very important notion because we're now seeing how cells are responding to chemical stimuli. And another important thing to take away from this is the fact that we're introducing a resting potential. And in the case of glutamate, when we had cations flood into the cell, there was a depolarization that occurred because the concentration gradient, the ion gradient that was previously established through these active ATP pumps, moving sodium ions out of the cell and pumping potassium ions into the cell, is we've eliminated that um, gradient. And this is called depolarization. And this is what we find in cnidarians, like we see at the bottom of the screen. This is an example of a polyp stage of a cnidarian, so it's kind of, it's immobile, it's sessile, it's bound to something, but it does have these kinds of networks of neurons that allow it to respond to stimuli. And the thing with cnidarians is that while they have these kinds of neural nets, they are very primitive in that they are very finite in the number of outputs you're gonna get from an input. So if you touch uh, one of the limbs of the polyp, it might cause one response and you know what you're gonna get, but it's nowhere near as sophisticated as the brain. But as protoneurons became more nuanced, and by nu more nuanced, I mean we have, instead of just glutamate now, other types of biomolecules that can elicit a, that can elicit a response within the cell, what we see are some other biomolecules will open up ion channels that are specific to let anions into the cell. And when anions are let into the cell, it will cause the potential to move away from the threshold potential, not towards it, and this is called an inhibitory response. And so with more advanced protoneurons, we have now excitatory neurotransmitters, such as glutamate and epinephrine, and we now have inhibitory neurotransmitters, such as GABA and serotonin. GABA stands for gamma amino butyric acid. And what we see with more nuanced uh, neurons and synapses is very important in the establishment of things called neural circuits. And if we remember that picture of the analid from the previous side, it's just an earthworm. It's got those two kind of uh, nerve cords on either side of it. 
we need to be able to understand how a, an, an annelid will respond if perturbed in on one side of its body. So if you were to touch an annelid a lot on the right side, you know from experience that the worm is just going to begin to bend away or towards your finger. And if we wanted to be able to uh, model how the annelid is able to do that, what we can do is construct a very basic neural circuit. So now that we have very complex synapses that can interpret not only electrical but also chemical stimuluses and not just one type of biomolecule but inhibitory or excitatory uh, neurotransmitters, we can make use of these neural circuits in which if a worm is stimulated more on one side, it's going to perform a response and activate muscle cells with acetylcholine, for instance, uh, based on the use of sensory neurons to transduce the tactile stimulus, such as your finger touching the worm. You're going to have interneurons whose job is to store information by looping the stimulus back on itself, as well as relay the sensory neurons information to uh, a muscle cell, for instance, a motor neuron. And what also will happen is if these interneurons communicate now with inhibitory neurons is we can deactivate other pathways. And we have inhibitory neurons in our own brain because if you are uh, trying to listen to a conversation while a song is playing in the background, you know that you're able to somehow cancel out certain stimuluses. And this is an example of that. And so um, we see how we can go from a very basic prokaryote into something as advanced as a neural circuit that allows us to perceive and process information at a very high level. And so um, this is going to wrap things up for this video. Uh, here's my work cited. If you guys want to take a look at it, there's another very good video on this stuff called The Origin of the Brain uh, at this link here, as well as these uh, citations from the textbooks. And I hope you guys find it useful. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.